Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining in our webinar on an extremely important and topical subject. I'm your host, Tom van Gerwe. I'm a global technical manager for poultry within the German-based company EW Nutrition. With me, I have two panelists today who will support this webinar with both content and technical issue support. So let me introduce them. The first one is Felipe Freitas Barbosa. He's a global technical manager for swine in EW Nutrition. Hello, Tuan. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining our webinar today. Thanks for the short introduction, Tuan. As he says, I'm the responsible for global swine team. Uh, we are developing strategy and service customers in the swine business. And of course, we are also supporting based here in Germany. I'll be here today supporting Tuan together with my colleague Andreas on answering questions or trying to support the way that could be necessary during the webinar. Thank you and we hope you enjoy the webinar. Thanks, Felipe. Felipe is Brazilian. I am from the Netherlands and we also have our panelist, the German scientist, Andreas Michels. Please introduce yourself, Andreas. So, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Andreas Michels. I'm head of biotechnology at EW Nutrition. As such, I had uh, our research operations, uh, mainly our biotechnology research in our labs that are located in Cologne. I'm basically here to uh, weigh in with the scientific side of the discussion. And I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thanks both. Quite an international panel for a very international audience today. There are several hundred participants in this call joining from countries literally all over the world. So just a few technical points to explain the setup of this webinar. I will deliver my presentation of about 25 minutes and during this presentation you can ask questions in the Q&A form that opens when you click on Q&A in the screen. If these questions are short and uh, can be answered in real time by the panelists, then they will do so. If they require a longer or more complex answer or if they are of interest to the entire audience, we will save them for the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So once we're done, you can leave feedback if you want. Once again, thanks for being here. And now let's start. So why use the title silent epidemic? You might have wondered, and I'll admit here, there is a clear reference to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic hidden in the title. The COVID-19 epidemic is devastating with over 35 deaths counted, while the number of confirmed cases is approaching 1 million. So the contagious nature of pandemics, viruses causing pandemics, is very impactful and the measures that need to be taken have a dramatic impact on the world economy and on people. We all sincerely believe that this pandemic will change the way we live and increase the effort that we will make to prevent this from happening again. However, beyond this slide, I will not be talking about COVID-19, but would like to draw your attention to a more silent epidemic, one that might be less contagious, but that is not necessarily less deadly. So WHO considers a AMR, antimicrobial resistance, an increasingly serious threat to global public health. A threat that requires action across all governmental sectors and society and the industry, our industry. And very relevant in these days is the impact that antimicrobial resistance has on the cost of healthcare and the use of hospital capacity in particular. So the 2050 prediction on 10 million people dying every year due to treatment failure caused by antimicrobial resistance is astonishing. And it might feel like a doom perspectives. And in a way it is because it's based on the assumption that do we, we do not change our way of operating. Well, 
the estimated number of people dying already today due to antimicrobial resistance equals last week's average daily death toll of COVID-19 of 2,000 people a day. So it's a silent epidemic that gets less attention, but that we need to help address as an industry. Now, to connect pandemics with this silent epidemic, I refer to research results from the previous pandemic. During the 2009 swine flu epidemic, 284,000 people died. Between 29 and 55% of the mortalities contracted a secondary bacterial pneumonia, thereby significantly contributing to the death toll. Klebsiella pneumonia is one of the bacteria commonly involved in bacterial pneumonia in human beings. And the graph, this graph from the CDC USA shows that would you get infected with this particular bacteria the probability of treatment success with antibiotics will vary dramatically by country. So little is known about the role of pneumonia in the current epidemic of COVID-19 and even less about the impact of antimicrobial resistance on fatalities. Therefore, today I would like to focus on what is known about antimicrobial resistance and discuss what we can do as an industry to stop this silent epidemic to turn into a, cri a global crisis. I would like to start with the customer perspective. I will use this survey, which was published a year ago in the US. In this survey, US customers were asked to what extent they were concerned about different topics when purchasing chicken products. For all of the concerns shown on this slide, there was a significant increase in people answering they were very or extremely concerned about topics like disease, food safety, and antibiotic use in chicken. This trend that was observed in the US can also, can also be seen to some extent in other parts of the world. And the increased focus on food safety, reduced antibiotic is a fact in many countries worldwide today. Now back to antimicrobial resistance. Through evolution, bacteria have developed different ways of escaping the effects of antibiotics. For antibiotic, that have a target inside the bacterial cell, a strategy can be to pump out, get rid of the antibiotic. Secondly, modifying the binding site for antibiotics, it can no longer be bound, which renders the antibiotic ineffective. So MRZ is an example of that. Thirdly, the bacteria can attack the antibiotic directly. There are enzymes called beta-lactamases produced by bacteria that can inactivate penicillins, rendering them ineffective. So resistant bacteria contain DNA that codes for the resistance mechanisms. These are the antimicrobial resistant genes or ARGs. Now antimicrobial resistance genes can either be located on the circular DNA of the bacteria, the host chromosome, but more often ARGs, antimicrobial resistance genes, are located on small DNA plasmids, called uh, DNA fragments that are called plasmids, like here. These are far more easier to exchange. Now, gene transfer can be done in two ways. It can be vertical, yeah. Resistance gene will pass on during bacterial replication as bacteria divides into two new bacteria. This allows a community of resistant bacteria to grow depending on the growth 
uh, uh, rate of, a, of the actual uh, bacterial cell. But horizontal gene transfer concerns the exchange of antimicrobial resistance genes between bacteria. And there are three ways in which this transfer can happen. Firstly, transduction. Transduction happens when bacteriophages, which are viruses that attack bacteria, are involved in the gene transfer. Conjugation concerns the temporary physical connection between two bacteria, facilitating plasmid or gene transfer from one bacteria to the other. And transformation is the active uptake of genetic material from a lysed bacterium. It's good to realize that these forms of horizontal transfer also can happen between bacteria of different species of, of different species. And some bacteria are more, are more effective in exchanging ARGs than others. I will come back to that in a, in a, in a few minutes. Now, antibiotic treatment or other stressors for the microbiome will trigger bacteria to start sharing antimicrobial resistance genes to these methods discussed. So once a particular strain has acquired a particular resistance gene, replication of that bacteria can lead to over-representation. This can be accelerated through selective pressure. When applying the antibiotic to which the bacteria has developed resistance, it will proliferate and outnumber the, the, the sensitive bacteria. Good infection control, which involves biosecurity, cleaning and disinfection, aims to prevent the spread of resistant bacteria. And with 80% of antibiotics being applied in animal production, as an industry, we are often uh, asked the question to what extent the resistant bacteria are being passed on to human beings. And to date, it remains difficult to provide a quantified general answer to that question. But more and more research is conducted to understand this. Um, studies have shown that antibiotic resistance Campylobacter, Salmonella tifimurium, and Salmonella newport have moved from animals to humans through food of animal origin. So anotic agents are easiest to research as the actual bacteria that transfer the antimicrobial resistance is causing disease in human can be cultured from stool samples and characterized. Here I want to focus on the risk of carries, carry, carrying antimicrobial resistant genes through contact with animals. These are three studies conducted in Asia and Europe. And by comparing the yellow and the gray bars, all three graphs are showing us that compared with the general population in yellow, the presence of resistant bacteria in poultry workers is higher than in the general population. There is also a strong indication of spread to family members of poultry workers, because here, in the case of the ESBL AMPC producing E. coli, about 27% of the E. coli occurring in poultry workers are resistant. And nearly 15% of the E. coli occurring in family workers, family members in poultry farms. So even for people that do not have direct contact with poultry, three times higher likelihood to carry a multiple resistant strain exists in this study. So in conclusion, antimicrobial resistance in poultry causes increased risk of exposure to resistance bacteria for poultry workers and their family.
Now, heavily uh, promoted and supported by non-governmental organization like WHO, FAO, and OIE, increasingly so, a so-called One Health approach is adopted in AMR research. To understand how resistance is spread amongst and between animals and human, different disciplines can no longer act in isolation as in conventional research. In the One Health approach, social sciences, public health, and environmental sciences work in close collaboration with animal sciences. By using similar methodologies and jointly defining their research objectives, this approach will increase our understanding of the dynamics of antimicrobial resistance. Now, to study the relation between AMR and animals and people, it requires projects in which institutes collaborate over long periods of time. This year is an example of a large epidemi epidemiological study on extended spectrum beta lactamases, in short ESBLs, conducted in the Netherlands. It involved the sampling and genetic analysis of various sample types. So how does it work? Right? The resistance genes present differ slightly in terms of their genetic makeup. And nowadays we can use sequencing and PCR technology to identify the different genes, allowing for a comparison based on genetic relatedness. So each dot here in this, in this graph represents a sample in which a particular ESBL gene was detected. Different colors, represent different sample types. The dots that are close to each other have identical or highly or highly similar gene makeup, which suggests that they are exchanging resistance bacteria and genes and thereby um, uh, form one pool uh, of genetic material that is being exchanged. Now, conclusions that were drawn from this uh, big research project was that human-to-human -human transmission is an important contributor to the spread of ESBLs, as different, uh, different uh, subpopulations of people were having ESBLs that were closely related. Secondly, it shows that poultry workers share antimicrobial resistance genes with broilers, layers, and poultry products. Thirdly, similarly, the ESBL present within the pig workers community is very closely related to ESBL from swine. So ideally, as animal protein producers, we rely on this type of One Health research to adapt our antibiotic strategy. But this type of research is not that abundant yet. And in the meantime, the NGOs apply the precautionary principle and aim to restrict therapeutic antibiotic use and ban preventive antibiotic use altogether in an attempt to halt the already existing silent epidemic. Now, WHO published a list of critically important antibiotics. We have high priority and high priority here. Now, cholestine, as an example, is an example of such critically important antibiotic of highest priority. In spite of its toxic side effects, this antibiotic has become a last resort antibiotic in human patients, for example, suffering from urinary tract infections that can no longer be treated with color, that can that can only be treated with colistine because of multiple resistance to other to other antibiotics. So for that reason, colistine, which was not used in human medicine for decades because of these side effects, 
when it became the last resort, it was added to the category of highest priority antimicrobials in 2016. You also see some other products that are or were regularly used in animal production and that now uh, have to be withdrawn for, 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 uh, from the industry. Now, what rules apply for, for human medicine and for animal production? The exact same rules apply and the consequence of products being on this list means that they should not be used as a preventive treatment applied by feed or drinking water in, in animals that, have, that do not show any symptoms. As a therapeutic antibiotic, they should only be used after bacteriology testing and preferably susceptibility testing. Now, there are limitations with regards to the off-label use. Off-label use should only be allowed for situations where no other alternative is available. And a ban on use of any antimicrobials as grow promoter is also pro uh, pr promoted by WHO. Now, why all of this? I want to talk you through an example from human medicine on how multi-resistance chains developed over time. So, beta-lactamases are enzymes that inactivate penicillins. I already used the example a couple of slides back. Now, if this gene that leads to the expression of beta-lactamases are located on the DNA of the bacteria. Um, the first thing that can happen is a higher production of the actual enzyme, rendering the bacteria less sensitive to the penicillins. Later, beta-lactamins appeared on plasmids. And plasmids, as you understand, allow for a more rapid dissemination across bacterial community. The bacteria became resistant to, to penicillins as a consequence of this plasmids encoded beta-lactamase, but susceptibility to available newer generation antibiotics called expanded spectrum cephalosporins remained. So these could be used at that point. But then extended spectrum beta-lactamases occurred. They are enzymes breaking down. Um, um, sorry. They, are, they were leading to antibiotics also, uh, resistance against these bacteria, these extended spectrum cephalosporins. But luckily, Clevelinic acid could be used to block the enzyme. So by using the combination, susceptibility was recovered. Until A and P C beta lactamases appeared. They were no longer inhibited by clevelinic acid, leaving carpapenems as the last resort antibiotic. Now the red race continued, and finally, carpapenemases started to appear. Sorry. And um, systemic infections with multi-resistant bacteria that are no longer susceptible to any of these drugs nowadays have a fatality rate of 50%. So with, with very few new molecules being developed into commercially available antibiotics, and with the very restrictive use of any antibiotics that makes it to the market, the pressure to reduce antibiotic use, both in human and in animal production, is there to stay. Now, E. coli is a commensal bacteria that is present in, the, in all animals, being a natural gut inhabitant. It happens to be a bacteria that is very capable of horizontal transfer of plasmids and thereby transfer of antimicrobial resistance genes. So 
This has been widely used as an indicator pathogen to monitor the development of antimicrobial resistance. <clears throat> so within Europe, the EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, publishes a report on a regular basis showing that the, the antimicrobial resistance pattern of E. coli in healthy animals. Here you see the pattern from 2018 report for eight different antibiotics. And every dot on this, on this uh, graph represents the average value of a European member state. So you see a high country to country variation in the resistance to veterinary antibiotics exists. Now, after introducing the concept of using E. coli as an indicator, I want to show you research from the Netherlands, because in the Netherlands, um, both the antibiotic use and the uh, antimicrobial resistance has been monitored for almost 20 years. What happened in preparation for the 2006 European-wide AGP ban was an increase in therapeutic antibiotic use as AGPs were gradually being withdrawn from the list of allowed feed additives. In the Netherlands, uh, the peak in antibiotic, therapeutic antibiotic use was reached in 2007. And shortly after that, legislative pressure occurred from the government uh, forcing the industry to reduce its antibiotic use. This has led to an almost 70% reduction from 2009, which became the reference year, to 2017. And the interesting and the reason why I show this graph is that the decline in antibiotic use, which is demonstrated by the bars, the vertical bars, was accompanied also by a reduction in antimicrobial resistance. The lines that run from left to right are percent are connect with the secondary y-axis and they show the percentage of E. coli isolated from the gut of healthy animals, broilers in this case, that were resistant to each of these different antibiotics here in the shown here at the bottom. Now where around 2000 for the, for these five antibiotics in 2009, 60, on average, 62.5% of the bacteria were resistant. Um, so eight years later, this was reduced by 50%. And uh, the, the percentage of resistant uh, bacteria was uh, reduced to 30% approximately. This shows that reducing antibiotic use can lead to better susceptibility of E. coli and with E. coli, because it is such an effective um, um, bacteria in ex inter exchanging antimicrobial resistance genes, also other bacteria in the gut of the animals are more susceptible to antibiotics. Now, the speed with which the industry is rebalancing or has to rebalance the way of animal producing animal will vary from region to region. That's why I use quite abstract, abstract time indications here on this slide, past and future. So where AGPs in the past were important elements contributing to animal health, antimicrobial growth promoters will disappear from the feed. Obviously, the circle will have to be closed again because as responsible animal protein producers, we all want to maintain flock health and profitability. So the emphasis on feed quality will increase. Anti-nutritional factors will have to be addressed. Birds will have to be fed to their needs and feed structures should be optimized to promote a proper functioning of the gastrointestinal tract. Now, quality, of the animals, the day chick quality as an example will be further optimized. 
will have to be further optimized. Ideally, it's in, it includes the eradication of vertically transmittable diseases from breeder stock. Think about mycoplasma and salmonella. Now, the use of modern vaccines that are to a lesser extent auto-triggering secondary bacterial diseases will increase. Vaccination will be an important tool also at the parent stock level. So for sows and breeders. And we will have to see how we can lighten the burden on these heavily vaccinated uh, uh, bre uh, breeders and, 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 uh, and, and sows. Additives will be increasingly used to increase digestibility, to modulate the immune response, to degrade or to bind anti-nutritional factors and to prevent enteric challenges. The reduced use of antibiotics will become, will come primarily from a better protocolized prescription behavior and reducing or banning the, any preventive use of antibiotics will definitely contribute to this smaller contribution of therapeutic antibiotic use for overall health management. Of course, all this requires optimal husbandry conditions and a high level of biosecurity, particularly in high density populated regions. But I, but I am confident that we can make it happen. The animal industry is very well structured to make changes, to adapt to new circumstances and uh, uh, to implement uh, best practices with regard to all of these elements. So to come to conclusion here, I have five points. Firstly, like an epidemic, like a pandemic, it takes action to mitigate the silent epidemic of antimicrobial resistance. Animal workers have shown to have increased risk of carrying resistance bacteria. So we should care about our colleagues on the farm. Then animal production as an industry has to rely less on antibiotic use and look for alternative way of growing a healthy animal with equal profitability for the business. Antimicrobial resistance is reversal. So antibiotic production is one very important key to make this shift. And animal health will have therefore be to be maintained through an holistic approach, including the different aspects that I showed on the previous slide. I want to close with this and move on to the question and answer section of this webinar. Um, Andreas or Felipe, could you take one or two questions? Hello, Tuan. Hello, everybody. Thanks for Thanks, Juan, for the great presentation you gave to us. We, we were having a good discussion here on the question and answers. And uh, the, the question was why such high levels of antimicrobial resistance in the European Union if EU has banned peace? Yeah? So this is, a, uh, this is a really learning process for us. And uh, the person that uh, answer, asked the question, you have a point here. You are absolutely right. So what we were trying to show on that graph is that indeed, the moment that we banned the, uh, the AGPs here in Europe, the level of is were still high. But we have to consider that we were coming from a situation that we were allowed in most of the countries to still use high levels of antibiotics. Also in that moment, we have seen that there was an increase on the use of therapeutic antibiotics which led to a constant increase of levels in EU. After the ban, and then also taking measures on controlling therapeutic use of antibiotics, and taking here as an example, the Netherlands, we could see that antimicrobial resistance went down. And we were coming, EGPs were still allowed, and we have seen an increase on antimicrobial resistance, but in the moments that we took actions on controlling it and reducing also the therapeutic use, 
we were able to reduce the curve this is also in Europe. Okay, maybe I can pick up the first one. Yeah, are there specific antibiotics that are more dangerous than others? I think antibiotics use is safe, relatively safe, but there are groups that are known to have a higher risk of toxicity. Yeah, cholesterol belongs into one group, uh, I think. This is, and then there are amino glycosides and the peptides where there are some antibiotics which have a higher risk of uh, um, toxicity or problems. Yeah, but generally when used in the right way, they're, is, they're quite safe. Um, and is there a way to detect microbial traces? So you mean if there is an early, early, uh, if there is a uh, technology that can easily and early detect uh, pathogens inside a flock, probably by uh, sampling feces samples. There are several possibilities to uh, to to do that. Uh, um, but especially you have to consider that doing that at site typically requires some experience in the lab and but there are technologies that are under uh, development which might be capable of delivering uh, at site analytics. Yeah. Um. Let me, let me address one here, uh, in, a question is here on diagnostic technology developed to detect AMR. Um, um, I would say there definitely is, uh, um, let's say the golden standard is uh, uh, a more laborious uh, assessment by, as I showed you in the example, first isolating the E. coli and then um, running the E. coli in the lab in, a, in an assay against a, a, a fixed panel of antibiotics to determine the MIC values. But uh, there is new developments out there that look more, uh, more broadly at uh, the genome and uh, new technologies uh, can, can uh, irrespective of the bacteria where, uh, where antimicrobial resistance genes are in, can look at the microbiome. This is metagenomics technology that is currently still quite expensive, but that might become uh, more and more accessible to um, to detect AMR in a in a in a more advanced way. So we expect that that in the future new technologies will definitely become uh, ex more accessible. But this is also challenging the the way to detect antimicrobial genes by DNA patches. So if you look into the, into, the, into the databases, you will realize that uh, many different genes are out there to, uh, to coding for these genes. And if you go for patches, you might, uh, you have to find the right patch which, uh, which predicts that these genes are there. So, but the technologies I think will come. Then a question about the possibility of resistance to phytobiotics. Um, we know that most of the phytobiotics or phytomolecule based products out there in the market are combinations of phytomolecules that have a different, uh, that have, that with each of the component having a different mode of action. So, uh, so far we are monitor, we continue to monitor this, but we have not come across uh, any, any evidence of development of resistance to these, uh, to these product. Uh, one, maybe one important uh, reason is that uh, uh, it, it does not, uh, it's not that destructive to bacteria as antibiotics are. So the selective pressure might, might all, is also a lot less than, uh, than for antibiotics. It's, it's not uh, as bactericidal as antibiotics typically are. So we have not come across any, any, uh, any, uh, uh, Good evidence suggesting that we develop that that we develop resistance to to these uh, type of additives.
Uh, then a question about the uh, update on resistance of tylosine in humans. Um, yeah, I mean, tylosine is on the list as a critically important antibiotics. And that means that we have to reverse the, I would like to reverse, re reverse the question. We have to look at ways of dealing with mycoplasma without having to use tylosine because it's simply going to be uh, uh, restricted for use in human beings because it is one of the critically important antibiotics, one of the macro macrolides, it's there on the list of highest priority critically important antibiotics. I not I, I have no 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 insight uh, in data of uh, a tylosine resistance, but the fact that uh, it, mostly when you're when an antibiotic is on that list of critically important antibiotics, it's because it's one of the antibiotics that still has a good efficacy against certain human pathogens, and they and it is the uh, aim to to maintain that efficacy. That's why they're there. So there's a question here from Antonio Palomo. Thanks for the question, Antonio. So what is uh, well, your opinion about the interrelationship between AMR and increase of lethality of secondary bacterial co-infections? Uh, actually, this is a quite uh, serious reverse for reducing the use of antibiotics in livestock that could somehow generate antimicrobial. There are some indications and some really critical or uh, serious comments and serious opinions worldwide saying that we could in the near future simple infection in the hospital due to the fact there's no uh, effective antibiotic to treat that infection. So for sure if we don't take anything and in the near future if we have a lot of antibiotics uh, uh, being uh, having used due to antimicrobial resistance. And we have to understand also that developing new antibiotics is something that takes a long, long money. So indeed, if we have this situation in the near future, if we don't do anything, we could increase the number of death or lethality, as you mentioned here, of secondary bacterial infections for the simple fact that we have no tools anymore to save, to, to stop them. Uh, so it's a really serious issue. And as I said before, one of the main drivers for reducing antibiotic in livestock. Um, one question from Khalil. Um, you ask what kind of diseases human doctors, for which diseases human doctors are prescribing tylosine, cholestine, and ceftiofur? Well, one example of uh, a disease in human beings where um, for sure the cholestine and the ceftiofur are being used is salmonellosis. And that I, I'm, I'm referring to that example because um, animal products are sometimes a source of salmonella for human beings. So being a source for human beings and also having a high resistance to cholestine and ceftiofur as a salmonella bacteria can cause a big issue uh, and outbreaks in the human population. So that is uh, that is why uh, cholestine resistance, ceftiofur uh, resistance is taken very seriously by uh, by uh, by authorities. There is a question from Ahmed. Uh, is there any way to control antibiotic resistant bacteria? So I think the easiest way is to uh, not to use antibiotics because then the selective pressure for the antibi so the antibiotic genes will be released and you can see that then also the the persistence of the antibiotic genes will be reduced anyway they will maintain they will not definitely go away so if you go back to the use of antibiotics again you will then start to select for them yeah
a lot of interesting questions coming in. Uh, how this will change the economy of nutrition programs, né? nutrition programs without AGPs? We wish we could say that from an economical point of view. Uh, we cannot say from an economical point of view what's going to happen if everybody stops using AGP. Nutritional point of view and from a management point of view, we do have to take actions right now. Uh, formulating diets for livestock without AGPs, it's not simply taking out the specific molecule and replacing it to, by something else. As Tuan mentioned during his presentation, in, uh, when taking out AGPs from our diets, we have to look at the, the farming. Now we have to reevaluate farming. We have to think about different measures. We have to think about different measures on the way that we are formulating our diets. So for instance, which level of specific nutrients are we supplying to these animals? One classical example, but we uh, talking to nutritionists worldwide, we still think that there's room for improvement is the crude protein level. So for instance, what is gonna be the impact of reducing crude protein levels in your diet? You could impact on the quality of the diet and modulating of microbiota, but this could also, in a second moment, decrease the impact of protein in your costs. So everything is related, and is, as I said before, it's really looking at the, con at, at the situation as a whole. Yeah? Having a look on the nutritional first, having a look on management, biosecurity, and everything else that comes along with that. We also have to understand that microbials, they are not cheap. Now we also have this idea that anti antimicrobials are cheap and therefore it's going to be extremely complicated to replace them from an economical point of view. But we do have experiences and we do have, uh, we have been talking to customers that they were successful on replacing AGPs by alternatives that one by one when compared are more expensive, but also doing other adjustments in the It's a really interesting area for us. It's something that we are doing a lot with the customers. And we do understand that will have also impact on the economy, uh, but it's hard to predict from a nutritional standpoint. Um, yeah, then a question, um, let's say a risk, a ri a ri uh, a question that goes into the risk assessment uh, science is the quantity of meat eaten per capita relevant for AMR risk? Very difficult to answer, but in in theory, uh, uh, it is uh, it is a potential route of exposure to uh, to bacteria. Um, it, it is not the only route of exposure, uh, clearly, because there's also environmental uh, route through which human beings can be exposed to to uh, anti to uh, bacteria resistance to bacteria from and human beings um, and um, i would say that um, uh, most likely the the uh, there no there is many other practices involved factors involved so it's not going to explain amr risk for uh, for more than uh, a certain percentage yeah, because um, other factors like kitchen hygiene uh, measures the amount of AMR present on the on the animal food product is definitely uh, one that might be far more impactful than the quantity of meat eaten so it's not it's not a, a, a I don't think the the solution is to eat less meat I think the solution lies in the industry to reduce the risk of attracting uh, resistant bacteria when eating meat. Talking about resistance in animal workers, uh, there is a question why there is a high antibiotic bacterial resistance in animal workers, as Tuan have showed during his presentation. Um, we have to think, and that was also mentioned during the presentation, that most of the antibiotics worldwide they are going into livestock the numbers itself, but also the way that we are using antibiotics in livestock. 
most of the cases when we are talking about AGPs, we are misusing the antibiotics. So we are not targeting any specific pathogenicity. We are not using in the recommended amount of time. So it's not only about the numbers of antibiotics being used in livestock, but also the way that we are using. Combining these two factors, we can expect that in livestock, bacteria are more prone are more prone type of resistance because of this situation if this happened also the transmission to animal workers of course will be something that's called natural because this is going to happen they are in daily contact with those animals that are in some stage carrying anti antimicrobial resistance bacteria and therefore the contamination of these animals worker animal workers is higher than the normal outside of farm population, let's put it like this, okay? So that's that we see here. Um, then a question from Ahmed uh, on the difference between probiotics and phytoge phytogenics or phytomolecules as and using them both, both, he refers to both as natural antibiotic promoter replacements options so yeah i would think there's a clear difference there as you already wrote uh, probiotics are live bacteria these bacteria are uh, supplied uh, to the um, to the animal and will uh, uh, these bacteria once they are uh, nurtured in the gut by the normal gut environment they will start to produce uh, uh, products that are interacting with the gut environment they will uh, interact with other bacteria or and with the gut wall and thereby with the um, with the uh, with the immune system now phyto phytogenic products are slightly different because they they are obviously not uh, not uh, living bacteria and they are interacting uh, uh, not only um, uh, direct they are interact in a different way with bacteria present in the gut and with um, with the gut wall and the mucosa and the interaction they have with the mucosa is dependent on the type of phytomolecule that you are considering. So uh, they are definitely both options that to consider, and uh, uh, but understanding the mode of action of each and one of them will 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 help you to decide to use one or the other or a combination of both. Um, what are the best options available for animal production without antibiotics? Um, and then Dr. Jivan Balsing, thanks for the question. You also mentioned that if organic acids and probiotics are being used, at what's the inclusion level we should be targeting? Um, from a technical perspective, it's really difficult to say that there's one best option for replacing AGPs in animal production. We do understand that we have several possibilities and within these possibilities, of course, we have the feed additives. So what we always recommend to our customers is to understand what type of feed additives he's bringing into his formulation and how this will help the animal uh, when coping with the pathogenic, with the pathogen. Um, another point here that we have to understand is that every single additive has a recommendation and there's a reason for that so for example if you're talking about organic acids you should all fo always follow the recommendation that the producer or the supplier is giving to you uh, we don't have also to um, think that using organic acids by using organic acids and simple for that simple reason will help us on replacing antibiotics so it's a combination of understanding your situation and using the additives as recommended for the suppliers. Of course, we do have our additives and we have a lot of experience with our additives in the field, but we also have to look for different alternatives. And these different alternatives, as I said before, should always follow the best practice of using. 
right dosage in the right moment, and most probably in the right combination of other alternatives also in the production. Um, I would like um, to address one question here. There's an anonymous uh, uh, submission um, uh, with the question if if I interpret it correctly, if non, non, not antimicrobial growth promoters instead of antimicrobial growth promoter would increase therapeutic antibiotic use. So if we take out the AGPs and we replace them with other growth promoting or AGP replacement, let's uh, additives, I would uh, translate this, do we run the risk of increasing antibiotic production? So um, that is, that depends on the situation we're in. There, uh, there, there was this tendency of increased therapeutic antibiotic use shown in the example from the Netherlands. Um, but I think that we have learned a lot from these experiences in Europe and um, are now also more, um, more um, holistically targeting um, how to simultaneously limit therapeutic antibiotic use by applying um, what I would call antimicrobial stewardship also um, in the same time when we're moving the AGPs. This also can involve the uh, application of uh, uh, on-farm uh, additive products to support the animals during periods of challenge. The, in, the person on the farm will have to be more reactive to early signs of of enteric or respiratory challenge and learn to how to apply alternative products in these early stages, improve the management and, uh, and reduce the need for therapeutic antibiotics altogether. It is definitely something that needs to be uh, uh, managed carefully because it would, be, it would be really regrettable if we take AGP out and we use more therapeutic antibiotics as a consequence because it is it is the therapeutic antibiotics which are which we share with human medicine more than the AGPs. So the pressure from the AMR perspective lies more on the therapeutic antibiotics long term than on the AGPs. I hope this answered the question. There's one comment here, Tuan and Andreas. I want you to help me here. I just want to make sure that we do understand the 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 the, the name of this webinar. Uh, it's asking if there's a way to detect microbial traces in animals before they are on the market. Uh, one thing that we have to understand is that antimicrobial resistance is something and antibiotic residues in the meat is something else. So if we're talking about uh, residues in the meat, I believe there are really uh, good technologies available in the market for detecting that. That's why all the antibiotics that we have for livestock, all, but most of the antibiotics we have in livestock, they have this uh, withdrawal period. Yeah? So you have to take them out I don't know, 10 days before slaughter, because there will be residues in the meat. So if this is what we are asking, yes, there are technologies in the market. Uh, if you're asking about antimicrobial resistance traces in the meat before the animals go to market, Tuan, can you help me here? Um, I mean, most of the technology that I know of uh, for detecting the antibiotics are done at the slaughterhouse, right? When we when we talk about, because that also might be the, the behind this, the detection of antimicrobial resistance genes. Yeah? It is uh, uh, it is very it is very uh, possible to assess it to some level, but it's important to understand that um, um, we can be free from antimicrobial resistance from some specific antimicrobial resistance genes, like like uh, cholestine resistance genes are very uh, uh, are, are, are studied uh, rigorously for products to be free from that particular uh, gene, MCR1, as an example. But th so then you have 
opportunities to detect that uh, before going to market in a fast assessment. But in general, um, antimicrobial resistance free production, that is not an option. That is not a real option. We have to uh, manage the load of antimicrobial resistance and not uh, uh, aim for a complete uh, AMR negative microflora. I hope it answers the question, um, Philippe. Um, I see there's a question about bacteriophages. Anurag, I hope I pronounced it correct, is asking recently bacteriophages are being used in livestock. Is it possible that this may lead to AMR gene transfer by transduction? If yes, how do we deal with it? So, um, I will elaborate a little bit more and uh, and uh, later on it and may answer it uh, if you if you if you bring the question to our attention by mail. But uh, generally, it is known that bacteriophages can deliver uh, antimicrobial resistant genes. For example, Salmonella. It is known that uh, there are phages that can live. Mostly, that these are phages that are already in the genome. Yeah so-called prophages that you can activate by an agent, sometimes also an antibiotic, and then they go into a different life cycle and then they can transfer. I have to look into it whether you can, uh, whether a bacteriophage which attacks a organism might also go into, uh, can deliver uh, an antimicrobial resistant gene that is present in this organism. Definitely, you will not use a phage that carries a antimicrobial resistant gene by atmosphere to a, an animal. Yeah, I will look it up if this is possible. But typically, a phage attacking an organism that will be used will go into a lytic life uh, cycle, so it will kill the cell. So, but but I will work a little bit more into it. And uh, I think if we have the, your email address, I will give more details on it. Yeah. Yeah. This is a very interesting question. Eh? The, yeah. yes. Some interesting questions pop up when you, when you interact with people on this topic. Um, Is there any is there any phytogenic molecule that affects mycoplasma and coccidia? So I'll answer that one. Phytomolec phytomolecule having an effect on on coccidia and, and mycoplasma. Um, for direct impact on mycoplasma, I'm not I'm not familiar. I'm not familiar with. But uh, there are definitely also fight, there are phytomolecule product out there that can help to um, soften the negative consequences that uh, a complicated mycoplasma effect it can have. So if mycoplasma is complicated by a viral infection, potentially another bacterial infection, think about E. coli, then we can have a complicated respiratory disease and then supportive products to um, uh, support during this respiratory distress have also a mucolytic effects are available. Um, with regard to coccidiosis is a very good question. I know there is a lot of interest into this area of uh, uh, um, coccidiosis control and, and phytogenic uh, uh, products definitely have a role to play there. There are, uh, there are molecules out there that have, that have shown some potential to be, um, to be anticoxidial. The big question is, is it potent enough to be um, considered a, a truly anticoxidial additive? That is the, uh, the, the, the assessment that one would have to do before, for example, applying it as a replacement of coccidiostats, if that would be the idea. I hope, Ahmed, that that is uh, answering your question. Thank you, thank you very much for this, for this interesting question. So as we are moving to the end of this webinar, um, I just would like to mention, because we have, of course, to respect also the time that you 
uh, spent with us and that you gave us to give you this type of information. I just want to mention that Ida Nutrition has, of course, uh, a page on LinkedIn and updating uh, information on this topic. Now, so we are constantly updating information on how to replace antibiotics, or what is the impact of antimicrobial resistance, what is being done worldwide in human medicine, but also in livestock to decrease the impact of antimicrobial resistance. Please feel free to go to LinkedIn and start following our webpage so you can also get the most recent updates on this topic. Yeah, I would now uh, respect the time and sorry, we, uh, I think we addressed uh, quite a good number of questions. There were, uh, there were some very interesting ones. Uh, if you are willing to do so, there is, I will uh, now launch uh, a, a poll um, in which you can provide us with some very, very valuable feedback. I would like to, um, um, I would like to uh, thank you for your attendance today. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, really valuable to have so many attendees joining. So um, I hope we meet again someday soon.